In my Hand of Light D&D campaign years ago, the characters were confronted by a band of Yugoloths. As I finished describing them to my players, I said, they attack, roll initiative. And then one of my players, Ben, said, really? With that one word, I knew exactly what he meant. You see, I was breaking one of my fundamental rules of D&D encounter design. So I backpedaled a little, corrected myself, and we went on to have one of the very best encounters in that campaign. Today, we are going to deep dive into D&D encounter creation. My goal is to make this as complete a guide as I can to designing and running encounters that both you you and your players will love. Number one, the three types of encounters. The first thing to recognize is that not all encounters are combat, nor should all the encounters in your game be combat. Now there are probably some groups who might enjoy that, but for most groups that will become old and boring pretty darn fast. There are in fact three different basic types of encounters you should use in your games. First, you have the pure social interaction where combat is very unlikely. This might be when they encounter a group of merchants traveling on the road, or perhaps the blacksmith is taking his wares into the next town over. Your goal with these types of encounters is usually to deliver information, progress the plot somehow, or just have a scene with a fun NPC that the players might enjoy. So the caravan of merchants we mentioned that the players ran into, well, they uh, happen to have some information about the next town over, in so much that there was a military coup and many of the merchants are being driven out of town. There's a plot hook, the adventurers might decide to go over and investigate things. And that blacksmith, well, same reason. He's going to the next town over to sell his wares because he can no longer sell them in the town he's originally from because, well, he and his family were exiled. The next type of basic encounter is the potential combat. This is where enemies, people who are probably negatively predisposed toward the characters are going to approach them or the characters are gonna open a door and happen upon them. And then the enemies open with dialogue. They don't immediately draw swords and attack. Instead, they talk to the characters. They don't like the characters. They might hate the characters and despise the characters. They don't attack. They open with dialogue, but they are also willing to fight if it comes to it. Now, your goal with these sorts of encounters in your game is to put an obstacle in the path of PC's goals that must be overcome either through their wits in talking with those monsters that have just challenged their presence in their dungeon, either with the dice, perhaps they try to persuade them or intimidate them or deceive them, and then have to roll for it and see how successful they are. Or through pure force of arms. If persuasion and deceit don't work, then it might just come down to fighting those goblins or monsters in that dungeon room. Your goal here also is to present a combat to the PCs if they so choose. Because you know, a lot of players enjoy combat in D&D. In fact, a lot of the core rule mechanics are based around combat. D&D is known as a combat focused game. So not surprisingly, many players love combat and that's one of the big reasons they play. So having a group of enemies that might talk to them or might come to combat if things aren't resolved in a different way gives your players the choice of, hey, we could talk, we could try to deceive or persuade, but hey, if we wanna just fight, we could just fight these guys. You're giving your players the choice, the option of how they want to engage with that encounter. And giving players choices and options in this game are bread and butter. The more choices and options they have, usually it's a good thing, unless of course they're the type of group that gets locked into uh, analysis paralysis and just can't make up their minds. And then, well, then you might have to try a different tact. Now, part of this thing though, of having your monsters talk first and not attack, is that you really should think of some role-playing reasons for having monsters attack first and not, not attack first, but having the monsters talk first instead of attacking first. There, there should be something that justifies that, a reason that they don't just attack first. And I, I think for a lot of intelligent creatures, even goblins or orcs or bugbears, things that are aggressive and nasty, they still have a decent amount of intelligence and they know that fighting is dangerous, it might result in injury or death. And so if something can be resolved in a different way, then they might be predisposed toward taking that route. So justifying it isn't usually that difficult. The next type of encounter you can have is that of immediate combat. 
In other words, the enemies simply attack. As soon as the characters become obvious and apparent to them, they draw their weapons or they bear their claws and fangs and they leap to attack. Dragons breathe breath weapons and stuff too. That's equally cool. And your goal with this sort of encounter is simply to present a combat that the PCs must overcome to progress their mission. I mean, you're essentially you're having a combat because they're just fun or because there is really no role-playing justification for the monsters not attacking on first sight. Now, in my opinion, these sorts of encounters where the enemies attack immediately should be rare. Usually you want to give your players the choice of whether they want, what, what tactic they want to use in bypassing I should say overcoming an encounter. However, sometimes it's what the bad guys would do and there's really no other option. But my recommendation here is that you do your best to provide a variety of these three different types of encounters in your game. Those where it's pure social interaction, where combat is very unlikely. Those where there's a choice of overcoming an encounter through talky talky, persuasion, diplomacy, etc., or through combat. And occasionally those where there is no choice, it's a combat and that's all there is to it. Variety is going to be king here. Number two, open with dialogue. I talked about this a little bit in the three different types of encounters that we just got done discussing, but beginning most encounters as social interactions is one of the very best pieces of advice that I can give you. This one thing will make your encounters and games so very much better. Trust me. And it is in fact my preferred method because it gives players options for how they want to proceed, how they want to resolve the encounter, either through intimidating, deceiving, persuading, bribing, or combat. Because I mean, you know, you get all of this gold in D&D 5th edition. The core room mechanics give you almost nothing to do with all the gold, even though the Dungeon Master Guide tells Dungeon Masters to hand out all the gold. Why not just bribe monsters with it instead? Because it's not doing anything kicking around in your bag of holding, is it? In my experience, I have found that putting the power of choice in the player's hands is usually best. Players seem to have a lot more fun when they can choose and when things aren't forced upon them and they have no choice. We've all heard people riot and rant about railroads and how unfun those sorts of games are. And when you give your players choice, even in small things like how to go through an encounter and whether they should talk or whether they should fight. When they have that choice in those things, the entire game is gonna feel less like a railroad. Even if you're kind of giving them a linear game experience with linear adventures and a linear campaign, when they can have choices here and there over small things, maybe not the adventure they go on because you're running a linear campaign, let's say, but it will feel a lot less like a railroad because it, linear adventures aren't railroads. And I have actual entire videos about linear campaigns and railroads and sandboxes. You know, I'll probably throw a link around here or something if I remember, or you can search for it on my channel. But a linear adventure in a campaign is not a railroad, but when players don't have choices in the small things like encounters, it can feel like a railroad and it can feel like they're just marching along and things are gonna happen the way they're gonna happen because the dungeon master has decided they are. Some of my group's most memorable encounters have resulted from opening with dialogue and giving players the choice. For instance, I have a video on my channel called D&D Story, My Players Tricked an Ogre. And in that video, you're gonna, basically in that encounter from a group from years ago, I had an ogre come across the group and instead of just having the ogre attack them, there was instead dialogue that happened and they ended up tricking the ogre, getting the ogre to go on their side and help them. And it resulted in one of the most awesomest encounters in that entire group over like the three years or so that we played together. Yeah, so uh, it was really cool. You can check that video out, it, yeah. Oh, and by the way, in that story from my Hand of Light group that I teased you with at the very beginning of the video, not starting the encounter as a social interaction was in fact the mistake I made. And I am very grateful that Ben questioned me on it because his really spoke volumes. It was his way of asking, so we have no choice but to fight? Aren't there any other ways we could resolve this? Would this encounter be better if we, the players, had some say here too? I mean, if what we try doesn't work, that's cool. We could always just fight them. But wouldn't it be more fun to at least let us try? Hey, where did my dog go? <laughs> it's it's the tried and true dog snatching. It works every time. Anyway, are you ready for today's sleazy plug with the barbarian and a little doggy? Now, this doggy's name is Zoe, and unfortunately she can't see. Um, she's blind. And you know, sometimes she, she also poops on the floor too, and, and then I have to clean it up. I mean, well, no, she, she actually poops on the floor a lot actually. I, 
I don't, I don't know why she does that. I think I think it's a chihuahua thing. Anyway, sorry for the um mildly inappropriate tangent. I, I love my little doggy doggy. I do. I just I just wish she wouldn't poop on the floor quite so much. Now, if you're a dungeon master without a lot of time to prep for your games, or maybe you're just a new dungeon master who's not sure how to design an interesting game for your players, or maybe you just like to wear blue face paint like me and have a dog who poops on the floor a lot. In any of these cases, I know you're just going to love Layer Magazine. What's going on, doggy? Yeah, my doggy loves Layer Magazine too. You see, Layer Magazine is the monthly publication that all DM Layer patrons receive, and it has tons of professionally designed Dungeon Master resources to help you run your D&D game. Each issue contains adventures with digital maps and other game elements, such as traps, puzzles, standalone encounters, magic items, NPCs, new monsters, and more. Now, lots of you may think that I write Lair Magazine myself with crayons, and while I do have a very nice crayon collection and lots of experience using them, that's just simply not true. So please stop perpetuating that rumor, even, even though it is very flattering. Thank you. Anyway, you can become a DM Layer patron at the link below and instantly get two issues of Layer Magazine and then every month you'll get a new issue. It's, that's why we call it a monthly magazine. It's like the very best thing ever and it's way better than cleaning up dog poop from the floor. Trust the barbarian. Become a DM Layer patron today. Right, doggy? Yeah, right, doggy? <laughs> yeah, that doggy. Here's my little doggy. <laughs> hey, what are you doing with my dog? Uh oh, gotta go. Well, I, I sure hope he takes her outside. <laughs> Number three, on designing non-combat solutions. Okay, so since we want the possibility for non-combat solutions to exist, we kind of need to have an idea of what they might be. And there are two basic ways to go about doing this. First, you can decide what those solutions are in advance. In the situation with the Yugoloths and my players, I could have designed that encounter to have different paths that the players might choose to follow to resolve it. Path number one, they simply say, screw that, we're gonna fight, and then they fight the Yugoloths. I might have decided in advance that they could bribe the Yugoloths, and I could decide upon the amount of money the Yugoloths would accept regardless of any sort of persuasion check. I might decide that for a lesser amount of money, but a very good persuasion check, they would accept that and go on their way. And I might decide that no matter what, if the bribe is far too low, that nothing they can, no persuasion rules whatsoever would con convince the Yugoloths to go away and not fight. I could literally build out all the possible different options that could potentially take place in that encounter in advance of the game happening. Now, of course, the downside to that is that it takes a lot of work and time to theorize and hypothesize all of the different things your players could possibly do to overcome that encounter. And the chances of you covering all of your bases in every possible thing is probably rather low and not gonna happen. So you might make the argument that you just kind of did all that work for nothing. Because of course, the other alternative is to simply decide the solutions on the fly. As your players come up with ideas for how they might circumvent or overcome that encounter, you simply role play your enemies in response to what your characters say and what they do and the dice roll. So in other words, you're not predetermining all the different possible paths before the encounter takes place, before the game happens. Instead, you're just kind of doing it on the fly. You're making things up and you're adjudicating and you're role playing the monsters. Here's the thing, of course. If you are a new dungeon master without a whole lot of experience, that might be challenging for you. There is a certain level of comfort and it helps to prepare a little bit your mind and stuff to think about these possibilities before the game begins. And if you find that useful, then do that. Do that exercise, have those possibilities mapped out in advance. However, if you have a decent amount of experience or you feel comfortable just doing it on the fly by role playing the enemies and just thinking on your feet, then by all means dispense with the preparation ahead of time and just simply react to your character, to the player's characters and what they say and they do in the dice rolls and role play your enemies and simply decide in the moment what your monsters are going to do. There's nothing to say that you have to have predetermined the monster's actions depending upon all the very various different things characters can do. You as the dungeon master are fully within your right to role play your monsters and decide in the moment what they do. Number four, advance.
advanced encounters, compound encounters. So your traditional D&D encounter is basically the characters and then a group of NPCs. Uh, we call them bad guys, they might be monsters, they're, they're all essentially NPCs, but some of them have ulterior motives, might be bad guys, evil guys, and stuff like that. Others might be shopkeepers and things like that. But basic encounter is characters and a group of NPCs. However, you can add an additional layer of complexity and fun to your encounters by combining this basic setup with other game elements, such as traps, puzzles, and social interactions. For instance, you might combine your encounter with a trap. I once had a game where the characters were going into a room and a beholder kin, I think they were called death kisses, descended from above and attacked them. Now in this room, there were also pit traps. And as the characters were fighting these death kisses and moving around in this room, they were triggering these pit traps because you know, they weren't being careful and checking and all of this stuff. They were in the middle of a fight after all. And then they were falling into these pit traps there were spikes inside them, they were taking damage, but not just that, the doors, the tops to these pit traps were spring loaded and after they fell in and took damage, they closed trapping them inside. And so this had the added benefit from the Death Kisses point of view, obviously, of splitting the party up and taking some characters out of the fight momentarily while they tried to figure out how to get out of this pit trap and how to open this door. Oh, and by the way, the Beholder can these Death Kisses, they could fly and they were floating around and attacking. They were not subjected to these pit traps. They used their brains and decided and determined their terrain in advance so that it would work in their benefit. And this is an example of a really cool encounter that we had by combining that encounter with traps. You can also have an encounter with a puzzle. In my ancient dragon game that I run for my patrons, there was an encounter where a nightmare of Zatirth, I'm not gonna be able to explain all the details on that, you're gonna have to just kind of use your imagination here. But anyway, they were fighting a Nightmare of Zatirth, this horrible dark lord in a domain of dread called the Dark Shards. And the battlefield here was like, there was some lake, not a lake, there was like a little pool or a puddle over here. There was some terrain and stuff. And then I combined a puzzle in there. Inside these different elements of the terrain were features of that puzzle things that they had to find and interact with, and then there was an overall puzzle that they needed to resolve. Now, the thing with this puzzle is that um, the monsters arrived and started attacking, and every round of combat, more monsters were arriving. It was becoming apparent that they would just have an overwhelming amount of monsters constantly arriving and attacking them from this nightmare of Zatirth that was uh, en enveloping them and taking them into it. And finally, probably around, I mean, my players knew that there was some sort of puzzle going on because they were fighting finding these puzzle elements, and they knew that they should resolve the puzzle. But through the first, like, I think two or three rounds of combat, they were predominantly focused on fighting the monsters. It only occurred to them after about round three or so that, hey, you know, these monsters aren't gonna stop. They're gonna keep on coming. I bet we need to solve this puzzle to stop them. Otherwise, they're eventually gonna wear us down and we're screwed. So they started to focus their efforts and tactically say who's gonna fight the monsters, who's gonna hold them at bay, and who's gonna go investigate these different puzzle elements so we can figure out what this puzzle is and how to resolve it so that we can stop these waves of monsters and we can actually survive. And in the end, they did end up resolving it and everything turned out just fine, but there was an element of tenseness to that encounter and perhaps desperation as well, as they realized that the bad guys weren't gonna stop until they figured that puzzle out that they had kind of been ignoring for the first three rounds or so of combat. The next thing you can do is combine your encounter with a social interaction. And, and this is really easy, actually. The basic idea here is that as the combat is going on over the courses of the round, the enemies continue to talk to the characters or perhaps taunt them while they're fighting. I do this a lot in my games and I feel like it really adds to the combat when you have the enemies engaging with them in conversation or taunting as you go. Of course, you need to be a little bit reasonable about it. I mean, each round of combat is six seconds. So there's only so much that you can say during one round of combat. It's usually like maybe a sentence, maybe. There was once this actual play, a very, very well-known famous actual play, a D&D show uh, that they put on, you know, Twitch and YouTube and stuff like that. And there was a round of combat where the characters were all having a conversation that lasted, I don't know, two minutes, two minutes. And finally the dungeon master says, okay guys, that was one round. Um, we're on to the next round. And I'm like looking at this and I'm just like, dude, that was not a round of combat. That was like two minutes of conversation. That was literally 20 rounds of combat. But anyway, 
I digress. Number five, creature selection. An important part of designing an interesting encounter is choosing the creatures that will be in it. Generally speaking, when you only have one type of creature in an encounter, let's say it's a standard goblin, that encounter tends to be less interesting. Now, adding different types of creatures makes the encounter far more interesting and tactical because the puzzle becomes more complex. Players will have more things to consider before deciding what they do, and their actions are more meaningful. Now, of course, when I say that the puzzle becomes more complex, I'm not literally talking about having a puzzle in the encounter. What I'm saying is that every encounter, when there are creatures and characters fighting each other, it, it is a puzzle in some regard. They have to choose where they're gonna position themselves, how to use the terrain, what spells they're gonna cast, what actions they're gonna take, who they're going to attack. That That is the puzzle. That is the challenge in your brain to figure out how are we gonna go about overcoming these enemies. Okay, so when we're deciding what creatures we're going to choose to put in an encounter, we need to determine, or we need to consider the three different basic types of creatures. You essentially have melee creatures, ranged creatures, and casters. Now, I know other people have broken down the types of creatures into far more categories. You have like brutes and strikers and ambushers and I don't know, there's a whole bunch of different things. You could you could infinitely break them down almost into tons of different categories. And perhaps for some people, breaking it down even more is useful and I'm sure it could be helpful if you really want to deep dive into tactics and stuff like that. But I like to keep things simple and considering just these three different basic types has served me fairly well throughout the years. And one of the things you're looking for when you're trying to choose your creatures and you're choosing among these three different types is synergism. You want to pick creatures that work well together. For instance, you could have goblins and goblin archers. The goblins engage in the front line and, and go attacky tacky and the archers stay in the back and perhaps they're shooting at the wizard, casting spells or at the cleric who keeps on using healing word. Or you could have goblins and wolves working together. Wolves have a trip attack that could yank characters off their feet and then the goblins swarm and stab with advantage. Or you could have a goblin and a goblin shot who stays in the back and casts spells while the goblins spread out up front and make sure the characters can't get at the goblin shaman. And we're just talking about basic types of creatures at this point. We're not really analyzing all of their special abilities because if you dig into creature abilities, you can find some really cool synergistic combinations that will make any combat that arises far more interesting. Now, of course, when you're choosing creatures for your encounters, you need to choose ones that support the adventure's theme, like the adventure as a whole. Like, why is there an ooze? in that castle have a reason for it. If you have goblins and wolves and goblin shamans, what is the giant doing there? Is the giant a mercenary perhaps that the goblins are paying to be there? Because you know, some giants aren't that smart. Or maybe the giant is in charge of the goblins and that's the big bad. But there should be a reason, there should be an ecology that works together and makes sense. And here is a really big suggestion for you. Um, don't have more, not, not that many, don't have more than three types of creatures in your combats. For instance, goblins, goblin archers, and then a goblin shaman. The thing is, is that when you have too many different types as a dungeon master, that gives you like that many different stat blocks that you need to run in the combat. And it can get to be rather difficult and it put a lot of cognitive load on the dungeon master. But when you only have three types or fewer, it makes things easier for you. <laughs> that reminds me, I once ran a combat with about eight or 10 different types of creatures. That means different stat blocks for each one of them. And it wasn't really my fault. I don't remember the exact details, but I'm pretty sure I had planned a certain encounter and then something happened and it caused different monsters from throughout the dungeon to coalesce or converge, I should say, on the player's characters. And then we ended up with this crazy massive combat. I literally had on my desk in front of me like eight or 10 different stat blocks that I had to run in this combat. And man, it was challenging. It was an amazing combat. I mean, the, the encounter, the fight was fun. We, I, I'm pretty sure we all enjoyed it a lot. But wow, was it challenging for me as a dungeon master to run that many monsters at once. By the way, if you're enjoying this video, finding the information mildly useful, please give me a thumbs up and leave a comment for the algorithm down below. Let us know your tips for creating and running amazing encounters in D&D. Or just tell us about a really cool encounter you and your group once had. Number six, loot placement. When you're designing encounters, one of the things you want to keep in mind is to place some valuables on the creatures so the characters will find something when they loot the courses. Courses? The corpses. Of course, that is, unless the characters forget, because we've all been in the game, either as players or as a dungeon master, where the, the players just don't loot the corpses, and it turns out there was something really cool on them. I'm often that player, by the way. I... I 
don't like exploration a whole lot. And so looting corpses and poking around on them is kind of part of the exploration pillar. And so I usually just let somebody else do it. And I just want to go on to the next part of the dungeon, part, next part of the adventure. So I, I'm the one that usually doesn't care a whole lot. And I probably, as a player, miss a whole bunch of cool stuff because I don't poke around dead bodies, which I guess is a expectation in D&D. &D. So anyway, this is not a complicated step, but it is important for there to be some tangible reward, even if it's minor, on the bodies of dead creatures your players are likely to kill. And remember, it doesn't have to be gold or magic items information is equally as valuable. Especially when you're like rolling in gold and magic items because the core rule books just tell you to give so much gold and magic items to your players, characters. Final point here too. You don't have to determine the loot in advance. You can always make up the loot on the fly as you go. There are actually loot tables in the Dungeon Master Guide that you could just roll on every time an encounter ends if they decide to search the bodies. So on the one hand, I'm criticizing the Dungeon Master Guide loot tables that tell you to give too much loot. And then I turn around and I tell you to use those same tables. I mean, I'm a hypocrite. I don't know what to tell you. I use those tables too. It's the resource that the game designers gave us. It's like what I use. I mean, Maybe someday we'll get better loot tables and a more balanced fifth edition economy. Wouldn't that be nice if like in the next edition they're coming out with one D&D, they actually balance the economy a little bit and make things make more sense? I mean, wouldn't that be cool? Number seven, terrain. Designing the terrain that will accompany the creatures in an encounter is one of the most overlooked considerations in encounter design. The terrain can make or break an encounter, in my opinion. Okay, here are some quick tips on terrain. First, avoid empty rooms or areas. Like, just completely empty. There's nothing in the room. There's no desk, there's no bed, there's no table, there are no chairs, nothing. It's just an empty room or an empty area. There, there's nothing of interest. You, you're like in the swamp and the swamp is just like knee deep water. That's it. There are no fallen logs. There's no branches under the water that you might get tripped up on. It's just emptiness, so avoid that. And you also want to design the terrain around the creatures a little bit as well. Are there wolves? Because you know, the goblins have wolves and they, they live in their own little chamber over here. Well, you know what might be in a wolf's chamber? You probably have some shedded fur. There might be bones lying around. There might be a big pile of junk that the wolves have dragged in there as well. I don't know what kind of junk wolves would drag into their lair, but let's just, let's just pretend they did, okay? You want your terrain to be thematically appropriate. If the goblins have appropriated an old castle, well, well, then guess what's gonna be in that old castle? Probably broken up furniture, things that are rusted and rotting away. Goblins don't take care of things, they just inhabit the place and let it continue to go to ruins. You might also want terrain that synergizes with creature abilities. If you're fighting kobolds in their warrens, guess what? Kobolds are little small creatures. They can fit through tiny tunnels. So you might want to have some tiny tunnels there that they can take advantage of. I once did that. That was fun. All my, all the medium sized creatures were like having trouble going through this, these kobold warrens and the kobolds were like popping in and out of these small tunnels doing all of these things. And wow, the players were kind of frustrated. Like this is what it feels like to fight kobolds in their warrens. Dang, I don't, I don't think they went back. Or you might have something like lizard folk warlocks that have that knockback ability added onto their Eldritch Blast. And you could couple it with pits or a chasm that the lizard folk warlocks are blasting the characters and trying to knock them into. And there's no, there's no saving throw on that either. So they just fall. Isn't that great game design? And I'm proposing that you use it against your character. Probably not a good thing to do, but man, is it tempting. A general idea here is that you want to have your enemies use the terrain to their advantage. And by the way, I did make a video called 10 ways to improve combat maps in D&D that has more thoughts on designing terrain if you want to check it out. Number eight, tactics. Getting everything set up is great. Picking your monsters, designing your terrain, all that kind of cool stuff. However, the tactics you, the dungeon master, and the monsters use during the combat is also very important. And many times these tactics are things I consider before the game session. That is, I plan them in advance as part of my encounter design. For instance, you could have waves come from nearby areas. There's no reason that when you have an encounter that Whatever group the characters initially find is the only group of enemies there. You could have goblins from nearby rooms come by because, because why? Well, the noise of the first combat alerted them. Or 
The goblins here decided to send a runner to alert some more of their buddies and bring them on over to help them out. Other tactics include taking advantage of terrain, using cover, going around corners to break line of sight so you can't get shot at, gaining the high ground, shoving your enemy into holes, knocking over furniture to create difficult terrain or to block doors, that sort of thing. And those are just general tactics you can use for your monsters in combat. You also have tactics that are specific to monsters themselves. In fact, I'm creating an entire playlist, an entire series of videos around monster tactics, tactics for the undead, tactics that giants will have, tactics for other creatures like Kuotoa or even goblins perhaps. Usually about one of these videos comes out every single month and I am compiling them into a D&D monster tactics playlist. I'll put a link somewhere around here for that if you wanna check it out. There is also a pretty decent book called The Monsters Know What They Are Doing that does a deep dive into monster tactics and explains what they would probably do during combat and explains why. Number nine, beginning the encounter. Now there are three basic ways that encounters usually begin. First, we're gonna call this one kicking down the door. Basically when you kick down the door of a dungeon, neither of the two parties were aware of each other. Both of them are, we'll, we'll say, surprised by each other's presence. In other words, they are on even ground and nobody has an advantage. The second way is that one of the groups is surprised. Perhaps the PCs get a drop on the enemies and could take actions before the bad guys do. Or it could be vice versa, because the third way is that the PCs are surprised. The enemies set an ambush or otherwise surprise the characters and the characters don't get to do anything during the first round of combat and the bad guys just womp on them a little bit. My suggestion here, as it usually is, is to have a variety of things happen. You're kicking down the door and both groups are pretty much on even playing ground. Other times, one of the other sides is surprised. My suggestion though is to minimize the amount of times the enemies get the surprise on the characters because it can feel a little bit heavy handed if the Dungeon Master's bad guys are always surprising the group and they're always getting to go first and having a free round basically of attack. So as a Dungeon Master, I try to do that rarely in my games. And the next point here is that how an encounter begins depends in part on Game Master design, but it also depends on the player's actions. For instance, in that situation, where they were kicking down the door and both groups didn't know each other was there. What if the players, instead of just opening the door, they decided to use a little drill or something and try to make a hole in that door or pry open a board a little bit so that they could see everybody who was inside that door. And then they were aware of them, but the people inside somehow weren't aware of them. Let's say they rolled a stealth check so that they were quiet about it. In that case, the players are aware of the monsters inside the room and they might be able to get surprise on the monsters. So it isn't just what you design in advance as a game master, but it's also what your players do in the game at the table. My next tip here is to use your words. Describe the enemy and what they do at the beginning of the encounter and during the encounter. Ask the characters what they do. Like when the goblins see them and drop their hands to the hilts of their swords and are ready to go, but don't quite attack yet. Describe that and then ask the characters, ask your players, what do you do? Do you say anything? Do you just attack? It's important when you're running an encounter like this at your game table that you're using your narrative descriptions, you're using your words, you're describing what's happening because otherwise your players aren't gonna know because they, they can't read your mind. Number 10, running the encounter. Now in the case of social interaction encounters where you're not in combat and there are no rounds, it's basically free for. Your players can say and do things as they wish and the creatures can as well. But what you're gonna find is that many of your players are gonna be more talkative than others and are gonna constantly be talking to the creatures, whereas you're gonna have quieter players that aren't so forthcoming and don't jump in and say things. Now, it's okay if all of the players don't want to contribute and feel better just watching other people doing all of the talking. But as a dungeon master, you want to ensure that they have the opportunity to participate if they want to. So when there are quiet players during an encounter, you wanna make sure that you call on them and see if they wanna say something too. You're gonna to have to quiet down the talkative players a little bit and ask them to give the other ones a chance and then call on them and acknowledge them so that if their characters want to say something to the NPCs in the encounter, they're able to do so. One of the tricks here that I've used as well is to have enemies directly address the quiet characters. Hey, 
your friend over there isn't saying a whole lot. What do you think? And there you go. They they have a need now to respond to the enemy or the NPC. Maybe it's not a bad guy. Okay, now if you're running the encounter and it is a combat encounter, Everybody has their own turn. You're running it in rounds. And so there is structure to that, which helps you facilitate that gameplay. But my biggest tip here is going to be to keep it moving. You want to keep the pace going. You don't want things to bog down and take forever during a combat encounter because combat should be exciting. It should be moving forward. There should be some action. It shouldn't be sitting around and for instance, waiting for somebody to make up their mind about what they're gonna do. That can get boring after a while. Anyway, I do have a video called 12 Steps to Faster Combat in D&D. If you're interested in ways that you can improve the speed and pacing of your combat, I suggest checking that video out. And next, keep using your words. Don't let your combats devolve into just saying 18 to hit. That's it, how much damage? 12 damage, 12 damage, cool. All right, what would you like to do? They roll dice, they hit, they do damage. We still want to describe things. We want to describe the enemy actions. Are they swinging their sword? Are they jabbing? Are they ducking? Are they blocking with their shield? Did they take a wound to the thigh and they're thumping, they're, they're like crunched over. What am I looking for? Hunch, hunched over, they're like hunched over in pain. Are they grimacing? Are they blinded temporarily from sweat that's in their eyes? Like, describe these things. Describe the smell, describe the blood, describe the grunts and groans, the cries of pain. There's so much cool stuff that happens during a combat that you could describe going on that will make things more exciting. Also, keep having the enemies talk as they go throughout the combat. Oh, that was a good hit, but I'm gonna get you next time. Things like that, it doesn't matter maybe. That's cheesy, maybe you don't wanna do that. Maybe you have different ideas for dialogue. Keep that dialogue rolling as well. Number 11, ending the encounter. There are various ways encounters can end. Death, where all of one side is just completely dead. Or maybe, maybe some of them are dead and the rest run. Or they all run. Perhaps enemies' morale breaks and they decide to book it and just throw their weapons down and run away, lest they be murdered. Or the characters might decide to run because hey, you know, that dragon is just gonna murder us if we don't get our butts out of here. Or shoot those kobolds, man. Can't kill those kobolds, those things are hard. Now, of course, the problem with fleeing in D&D 5th edition is that the rules don't support it very well. Running away in D&D kind of sucks because, you know, the rules, basically the first side that decides to run away and try to run away is probably just gonna die that much faster. So my suggestion is that instead of trying to use the 5th edition combat rules, when one group tries to run away. Instead, I would shift to using a skill challenge. Basically, if one side of the combat can reach the edge of the map that you're using, you could initiate a skill challenge. Or what you could do is at the beginning of a round, if the players all decide that they're going to run away or the enemies all decide that they're going to run away, you immediately drop out of combat and you start in on a skill challenge. Now, if you're interested in how to run a skill challenge in D&D 5th edition, I have a video dedicated to explaining our skill challenge system. It's titled Running Skill Challenges in D&D 5th Edition. You can go watch it and it'll explain exactly how to do it at the game table. And if you're looking for our 5th Edition skill challenge system in writing, because that makes it easier to reference and all that kind of stuff, then we did publish it in the July 2022 issue of Lair Magazine, Wishes and Waste, which is now on the DM Lair store. You can just go over there and pick it up and it has our skill challenge system for 5th Edition in there. There will of course be links to all this stuff I'm talking about somewhere, probably in the description or the, or the pinned comment. Next, you have surrender. It is quite possible that the characters will decide to, no, I, I don't think, I don't think I've ever had players decide to surrender in a game. Like that never happens, at least in my experience. But enemies will very often surrender in my games when it's clear that it's over, they'll throw down their weapons and give up. And one of the reasons I enjoy doing this is that it presents a moral dilemma to the characters. Like, what are the characters gonna do? What are the players going to do at this point? Sure, they're going to interrogate the surrendered enemy and try to get some information from them. That That is a given. But are they going to use torture? Are they just going to try to use intimidation or persuasion? There's a little bit of a moral dilemma there. And then what happens after they get done with the interrogation? And either they got all of the information out of the enemy or it becomes clear the enemy is not going to talk. Are they just gonna let the enemy go? 
Are they going to tie the enemy up and take the enemy along with them with the intention of turning them over to the town guards? Or are they just gonna like, you know, slit the throat and uh, walk away? It's a moral dilemma, a quandary that can present interesting situations at the game table. Oh, and by the way, when the bad guy is giving out information, my suggestion here is to be careful with what you reveal. You wanna give the players something for the effort of trying to get information on the bad guy. But don't give them too much. I mean, unless you were planning on it and you, you, you have an idea of what you're gonna do there. You want to reward the players. You don't wanna give them the entire treasure hoard. Okay, cool. The enemy has surrendered and the characters decide to take prisoners. So they're not gonna let them go and they're not just gonna kill them. They're gonna actually take them as prisoners. So do they just string them along with them and they just have to pull them along and hope they don't join the bad guys or run off or something? Do they leave them tied up in a different part of the dungeon so that they they maybe aren't in the way, but then that raises the question, of course, what if the prisoners try to escape? They slip their ropes and they get away. Do they reunite with their buddies and help them in the future? Do they just book it for a different dungeon and join up with the ogres down the street? Or, or in the case of releasing the hostages, I mean, do the bad guys just leave? Do they circle back and join up with the other bad guys? I mean, there's, there's so many different cool things that can happen here in these sorts of situations. And this is one of the reasons that I have my bad guys surrender at times because I wanna present the players with all of these different choices and opportunities because cool things can result. Click on the screen now to watch my D&D encounter building playlist for more information about building awesome encounters for your game or to become a DM Lair patron and get an issue of Lair Magazine every month. Don't do it for me, do it for the doggies. Oh, sorry doggy. <laughs> oh no.